Hello and welcome. My name is Nancy Strahan. I'm the program director of the Community Parent Resource Center with Lynx Resource Center in Wasilla. Today's training is going to be talking about compassion fatigue. We're going to talk about what it is, what the symptoms of compassion fatigue are, how you become aware of if you're experiencing compassion fatigue. And then also we're going to talk about some tools and strategies to uh, practice in order to avoid compassion fatigue and how to come back from it. So compassion fatigue is also known as the cost of caring. It's a term that describes the physical, emotional, and psychological impact that comes from helping others, usually through experiences of stress or trauma. It's also known as vicarious traumatization or secondary traumatization. It's that emotional residue uh, or strain of exposure to working firsthand with those who are suffering from the consequences of traumatic events. So think about it as almost a bit of a contagious um, thing where if you're treating someone who has the flu, you might catch that or you might get some version of that from them. Or if you're holding a wet painting or touching a, a wall that isn't quite dry, you might get that paint on your fingers. It's that, that transfer of trauma. So who's at risk? Really anybody who has direct care with somebody who has experienced or has experienced trauma is at risk, but there are some categories of um, individuals who are at a higher risk of compassion fatigue. Those would be first responders, so uh, firefighters, um, 911 responders, those individual police officers, um, personal caregivers, that can be both professional, so like direct support providers for individuals with um, medical needs or physical disabilities or uh, intellectual disabilities that are experiencing trauma, but it can also be um, things that like personal caregivers at home. So say you're a parent and you're caring for um, your child who may have complex medical needs and trauma that way. Or you are caring for your parent who is perhaps experiencing Alzheimer's or um, dementia. That can be an indicator of a high risk to compassion fatigue. Um, but also teachers and educators who work firsthand in long lengths of time with individuals such as children who may be experiencing stress or trauma. And then, of course, healthcare providers, um, really the, the healthcare providers that did all of the hard work during the pandemic were a huge catalyst to bringing forth the term compassion fatigue and the importance of being able to treat it and be aware of it. So what are some symptoms of compassion fatigue? Well, the, the tricky thing is, is that compassion fatigue does look different depending on the person it's affecting um, because it deals with your behaviors and your traits and your characteristics. But there are some shared symptoms that um, everyone should be aware of. So things like decreased interaction with others, so self-isolating more than you normally do, um, irritability or lack of patience that's outside your characteristic, feelings of hopelessness or powerlessness, so not, not feeling like you're able to make a difference or not thinking that you're in control of your own life, um, poor self-care, so not taking care of yourself the way you, that you used to, the, uh, beginning to receive a lot of complaints about your attitude or performance, especially at work. If, if you're having a lot more complaints about your attitude at work, you may need to, to be aware of that, but also if you're just fighting a lot more at home and more than what is normal for you, then you should also be aware that that's a symptom of compassion fatigue. Um, difficulty sleeping and nightmares, reoccurring nightmares is a listed multiple times as a symptom of compassion fatigue. Um, mental and uh, physical fatigue, just being completely burnt out. That's why uh, compassion fatigue is often mistaken for burnout, even though they are two different things. And then difficulty concentrating, Emotional outbursts, so just being right on the edge of an emotional outburst is a symptom of compassion fatigue. Physical ailments, they say that um, chronic headaches, chronic back aches, um, physical manifestations of that compassion fatigue can occur. Uh, a them versus us mentality, starting to abuse substances, um, lack of personal boundaries. Not only is this a symptom of compassion fatigue, it's also an uh, a, uh, indicator or a a trait that makes you more at risk for compassion fatigue is not having those personal boundaries in place. And then empty tank, we talked about this, that could be an empty tank at work or an empty tank once you get home, 
uh, just not having anything left to give when, uh, when you probably should have more. And then overdeveloped sense of responsibility, thinking that if you don't do it, it won't happen. Blaming others for their suffering. Um, that's probably the most uh, well-known uh, concept of compassion fatigue. Although as we see, compassion fatigue is much more complex than just blaming others for their own suffering. Um, and then feeling less productive at work, even if you know you are doing the best you can, just feeling that it's not making a difference and you're not doing enough. So now that we know what the symptoms are of compassion fatigue, you're aware that being able to recognize your own indicators of compassion fatigue is a, is a key element in uh, managing it. So there's a couple different tools uh, that experts have said are useful in this. And one of those is called a window of tolerance. So imagine your window of tolerance is the amount of, <laughs> amount of like irritation or stress or maybe negative things that you can tolerate before it's just outside of your scope. So um, say you normally have a base size window of tolerance, little things can happen and you can manage those or normal day stresses can happen and get stuck, stuck in traffic, no big deal. Um, but the window of tolerance tends to shrink quite a bit for individuals experiencing trauma or even secondary trauma, so compassion fatigue. Um, so I'll give you a couple of scenarios to, uh, to explain this better. Imagine you get milk out of the fridge and you drop it and it spills all down the door of your refrigerator. One day when you're not experiencing compassion fatigue, you might think that's no big deal. It's, it's annoying, yes, but you just clean it up the inside of the door, you put the milk away, and you go about your day. Same thing, exact same thing can happen, but if you're experiencing compassion fatigue, that could be the end of the world. Like you could uh, slam the refrigerator door, throw the milk into the sink, just you know, completely be disrupted throughout your whole day by this event. That probably indicates that your window of tolerance is quite small at the moment. Another scenario, you can have two people in a car stuck in rush hour traffic, one's white knuckling it, just cussing under their breath of how annoying this traffic is. While the other one, you know, is just like, yeah, it's annoying, but we knew we were leaving at five o'clock, we'd hit traffic. So we left a little bit earlier. I think we'll still get there on time. It happens. Same exact situation, two very different windows of tolerance. So just be aware, if your window, your normal window starts to shrink, you may be on your way to experiencing compassion fatigue. So another strategy is the red, yellow, and green zones. So this, this strategy is basically knowing your own behavioral warning signs when it comes to compassion fatigue, and then intervening in the yellow zone to keep you out of the red zone. So, um, Behaviors can be physical, emotional, and mental. And this is when it's really important to know your own behaviors because what might be yellow zone behaviors for you are green zone behaviors for somebody else. So I'll, I'll give an example of a physical red, green, and yellow zone. Um, so your green zone, you're not experiencing any compassion fatigue, you're doing well, is after work, you go home and you exercise. Say you, you go home, you have dinner, and then you go to the gym, or you go home and you go and walk your dogs, or you do yoga, you move your body. That's that's your green zone, that's your routine. You tend to do that three to four times a week. Yellow zone, you're starting to be really stressed out at work. You just don't have any energy. You get home, you're, binge, you're binging Yellowstone. You're watching at least one season and then having dinner and going to bed. Now, if you start to do that more times than you're exercising, and four times this week, you've just binged TV and haven't done any of your, your workouts or your movement, you may need to realize that you're in the yellow zone and start to do some things to bring you back into the green zone. Now, the red zone is you're not binging a TV series. You get home, you're having a glass of wine, you're fighting with your spouse, and you're going to bed. You're, you're done. Your tank is empty. You have nothing left to give. You don't have energy. You don't have mental capacity. You're not contributing to yourself, your household or society. So that would be your red zone. And we wanna keep you from that. So you need to be aware of what your yellow zone is so you can move back into your green zone. So another example would be an emotional one. 
So we're going to use the workplace for this one. So the green zone is emotionally, you're on time to work. You're happy to be there. You interact with your coworkers. They're not your best friends, but you really enjoy having those hallway conversations with them. You're a great part of the team. Yellow zone, you start to be late to work. You close your office door. You're irritated by your clients. Your staff and coworkers are annoying you. You're just, you're a little bit withdrawn. You're a little bit like, leave me alone, sort of yellow zone. Red zone would be you're calling in, you're using your PTO days just to not have to be there. You are avoiding Monday like the plague and you're starting to have performance issues or complaints about your attitude that it's just been too much lately and people are really starting to notice. You need to start doing the intervention when you're in that yellow zone before you get to the red zone. So now that you have some tools to be aware of your own uh, scale of compassion fatigue, how to notice when you're sliding into that. Um, there are some skills and options that could keep you from getting to compassion fatigue, or if you're at compassion fatigue, working your way back into either a big window of tolerance or back into the green zone. So the first one is to make a self-care plan. I know that that sounds a bit ironic or overused, but really, if it's done right, it's a great tool to reduce compassion fatigue. The, the main things to keep in mind is make the plan authentic to you. So if, if uh, journaling, if journaling is something that sounds like a chore to you, don't put it in your plan. If getting up at 4 a.m. to go for a walk before work is just you're not a morning person, that's horrible for you, don't do it. Don't put it in your plan. These are things to like make you a physically healthy person. This is things to reset you, to fill your cup back up. So make it authentic to you. So for somebody else, it might be quiet time, but for other people, it's movement. And for other people, it's socialization. So it really depends on who you are and what fills your cup. But then also make sure it's sustainable. So if, if you're trying to get up again at 4 a.m., but you know that you're not able to go to bed till 10 the night before, it's not really sustainable. Or if you're saying, I'm going to read for an hour each evening, but you also know that you have to put your children to get bed and prep lunches and all of that, that's probably not sustainable. And we don't want to make you feel like you're failing at another thing. So make sure your plan is sustainable, achievable, and it actually motivates you. Um, so the next thing is build your tribe. So tell others about your warning signs once you know them. Tell about your red, green, and yellow zones. Ask them for help when you are in that yellow or red zone. Share your struggles in a safe space. Um, so if it's with your partner, say, you know, hey, if I'm, if I'm coming home every day and watching Yellowstone, maybe encourage me to go for a walk with you or get outside and get some fresh air or take me to dinner, you know, if I'm just too tired to make dinner and I've ordered Domino's four times this week, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, tell others about your warning signs. Make sure you share your experience because you're going to have a bigger support network and be able to rely on them more. And then another one is gratitude. So research shows again and again that practicing gratitude increases a person's resiliency. And resiliency is key. We're going to get to that uh, more in depth a little bit later. But gratitude, you can, if you don't like to write things down, don't, don't keep a gratitude journal. But if you do, then keep a grat gratitude journal. If you don't, just say three things that you're grateful for each day. And you don't have to do it at 4 a.m. before you have your coffee. You can do it in the middle of the day. You can do it at night. Whatever, whatever works for you. But just practice saying those things out loud to keep you grounded in gratitude. Or if you experience compassion fatigue at work, have mission moments. Keep a little journal of like, well, this is, this is why I do what I do. Yes, it's hard some of the time. Yes, it comes with these obstacles. But here's this one thing that happened that is really the core of why I keep working here. So keep keep a mission moments journal or just share mission moments with your team, things like that. So some workplace specific strategies, because um, a lot of individuals who experience compassion fatigue tend to experience it at work. So here are some specific ones you can apply to the workplace. Uh, again, along with building your tribe, have support groups, open discussions at work about compassion fatigue and the reality of it in the workplace. Take regular breaks. Don't, don't put your nose to the grindstone all day long. Take breaks. 
um, have routine check-ins. Maybe you have a buddy at work that you do a check-in with. Maybe you check in with your team. Maybe you have whole staff meetings where you guys do a check-in, something like that. Provide mental health days. And if you're a leader, you you start that off. You raise your hand and say, you know, I'm, I'm taking a mental health day today. I need to get myself back into a back into a green zone, back into a better place so I can keep serving longer. Um, On-site counseling for companies that may be able to do that, relaxation rooms, meditation classes, et cetera. Um, walking meetings, if, if you don't have the ability to, to have relaxation rooms, do walking meetings, get outside, um, get some fresh air. Again, with this, um, if you're experiencing passion fatigue at work, or your your coworkers and staff are encourage them to do offsite lunches. Change the environment. Let them take a break from that. Um, and then, of course, team and staff activities just uh, really shows the individuals that are working and experiencing compassion fatigue that they're not alone in it. That it's a shared experience, and they have a a tribe they can rely on. In reality, compassion fatigue is likely to happen, especially if you do have uh, repeated exposure to individuals who are experiencing trauma. Um, so it's really important to have good strategies in place. But the number one trend for reducing compassion fatigue is resiliency. And resiliency, as much as people may think that it's something people have as characteristic or they don't, that's not necessarily true. You can build resiliency as a skill, especially with certain techniques and practices, you can become a more resilient person. And if you become more resilient, it's going to take you a lot longer to get to compassion fatigue than it normally would. Sorry, I jumped. My phone rang. So resiliency. Resilience refers to how well you can deal with and bounce back from difficult or stressful situations. So as I was saying, but it being resilient, it's going to take you a lot longer to move towards compassion fatigue because you're able to bounce back from each individual traumatic residue experience a lot better than if you don't have resiliency. So here are some ways to build your resilience as a characteristic. Find a sense of purpose. Instead of being discouraged by your problems with a defined purpose, you're going to be more motivated to learn from past experiences and keep going when things are difficult. Believe in your abilities. Having confidence in your own ability to cope with the stresses of life can play an important part in resilience. When negative thoughts start to occur, practice immediately replacing them with positive ones. Instead of saying like, this is too big of a project for me, say, I can do this. I'm good at my job. I'm capable of this. Um, if, you're, if your negative thought is, I can't, I can't get through to this family, just say, I, I can help people. I can make a difference. I can change this one thing. You know, I can help them with this one thing. Practice immediately changing those negative thoughts into positive ones will really help you believe in your own abilities and build confidence in yourself. Embrace change. Well, that's supposed to be a little caterpillar picture, but it's not. Um, but flexibility is an essential part of resilience. So by learning how to be more adaptable, you'll be better equipped to respond when faced with a life crisis. So resilient people often utilize these events as an opportunity to branch out in a new direction, to take new approaches. So by by hitting a roadblock, they don't think, oh my goodness, this roadblock is huge. Like it's, this is going to take forever to overcome. They they tend to think, okay, I've hit this roadblock. Maybe it's there because it's, I can find a different way around. Maybe I need to be innovative rather than trying to just chisel my way through this brick wall. So resilient people tend to be a little bit more flexible when they hit obstacles in life. Develop problem solving skills. So research suggests that people who are able to come up with solutions to a problem tend to cope more productively with stress compared to those who cannot find solutions. So again, like you're hitting that wall, you're not just looking at the problem, you're thinking, well, maybe I can find a different way around or let's climb over this or that kind of thing. So whenever you encounter a new challenge, make a quick list of some potential ways to solve it. It doesn't need to be a perfect list. The, the, the ideas to solve the problem don't need to be fully conceptual. It doesn't need to be totally planned out. It's really the practice of saying, when I hit problems or challenges, I come up with solutions. 
So just that's a great skill to practice is if you hit a hit a wall at work, just make a quick couple of ideas down. If they don't work, that's okay. You're practicing replacing that thought pattern with when I hit a challenge, I come up with ways to solve it. So be optimistic. Staying optimistic during dark periods can be difficult. We're all very, very aware that we uh, tend to think of the negative, but maintaining a hopeful outlook is an important part of resiliency. So what 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 you are dealing with may be difficult. It may be a traumatic event, but it's important to remain hopeful and positive about a brighter future. And here's um, a really important one. Reset your thinking traps. This was supposed to be an illustration of a mouse trap, but it says it's not showing up. But there are thinking traps that people who don't have resilience characteristics tend to have. So some of them are thinking everything is black and white. So everything is either great and perfect or everything is terrible. E everything is completely right or it's horribly wrong. So this one thing has to be exactly this way or it's never going to work. Those are black and white thinking. Remember that everything is, the whole world is gray. Everything has a gradient. So just know that it's not one or the other. Nothing is black and white. Um, everything is a gradient. Um, so catastrophic thinking is another thinking trap. So expecting the worst possible outcome every time. I'm, I'm never going to get this promotion because I just can't get the experience I need, or I'm never, I'm never going to get through to this family because I've tried a hundred times. Maybe the, the time they needed is that 101 time. Maybe it's 200. Just don't go to the very worst possible outcome and not acknowledge that there are other outcomes that are possible. And then predicting the future, imagining you know exactly what will happen far into the future. So again, it would be like, um, I'm never going to be able to help that person, or I'm never going to reach uh, this goal that is set. It's too big. Know that you can't predict the future. Things can change. Maybe you won't hit that goal, but you'll you'll have a different goal that happens. Or um, maybe you will get through and be able to help that person. So predicting the future is a thinking trap to be avoided. And then again, um, catch yourself. These are ways to avoid those thinking traps. So catch yourself. Notice when you are spiraling into a trap, you might start feeling sad, panicky, hopeless, all the symptoms we talked about before. Um, be more holistic in your thoughts. Ask yourself what's real and what's not real about what you're thinking. What are the gray areas? What are you missing in the in-between possibilities? What's actually possible that's going to happen? It's not an all or nothing thing. There's many possibilities. And then also using a coping mantra. Come up with a phrase to help you answer your, your worries. So I'm doing the best I can and I'm going to be okay. You can also say things are going to work out. I just don't know how they're going to work out. Things like that. So lastly, we're going to talk about the three secrets of resilient people. So what do resilient people do? Resilient people know and acknowledge that bad things happen, that suffering is a part of the human experience. The world is not out to get them. This is not something that happens just to them. They're not asking themselves, why me? They know it's a shared experience and that it's a part of life. Resilient people are selective of where they focus and put their energy. They focus on what they can change and they accept what they cannot change. They focus on the good over the bad. They make the choice every time to focus on good or focus on what they're able to change. And resilient people ask themselves, is what I'm doing helping or harming me? So when things get really tough, resilient people tend to say, is like if somebody lost lost a child, which is a terrible traumatic event, a resilient person tends to say, I, I'm just staring at these pictures of my child and it's just putting me in this downward spiral and I'm right back into that moment. Is what I'm doing helping me or harming me? If it's harming me, maybe I should put away these photos and go for a walk, that kind of thing. Um, they ask themselves the way I'm acting, what I'm doing, is it doing harm? That question gives Brazilian people an element of control in what can sometimes feel like an uncontrollable situation. 
So those are the three secrets of resilient people. And those are all skills that can be adapted by absolutely anybody. And if they practice them, they will increase their resiliency. So remember that compassion fatigue is preventable and treatable. That resiliency is a skill that is learned, but it takes time, effort, and practice. And finally, remember that you're not alone. There is power in sharing your struggles and there's power in sharing your goals towards becoming more resilient. So share your experiences, find your tribe, and put some of these skills and practice um, to the test and build, build your ability to experience compassion fatigue um, and bounce back from it and build your resiliency that you don't have to experience compassion fatigue as often. So thank you. Um, if you have a chance, please use the QR code to fill out a short survey about our trainings. This uh, lets us know if the topics we're covering are useful and the way that we're doing it is useful, but also it helps us know what to put out next. And then if you have any questions, um, you can contact us at 373-3632 or visit our website. And then you can email me if you have any other questions about today's training. Thank you.